this lecture and this session is probably one of my favorite things to talk about and it is research in educational uh, literature and at first when you hear that topic you may think well this is going to be kind of boring but I want to suggest to you that if you really soak in uh, what this lecture will present it can be something that can really transform your teaching this is based off of a, a session that I've done with our teachers at our school as well as at a teachers convention and I've gotten some really good responses from it. I hope that you'll find it helpful as well. In this unit, unit four, on uh, learning and learning styles, we've been talking about the idea that people understand in different ways. Uh, young people have different modes of learning and different intelligences when it comes to learning content. And so I want to ask us the question today, uh, am I a transactional or a transformational teacher? Am I a transactional or a transformational kind of teacher? What kind of teacher are you? Now, are you a teacher that sim simply makes transactions with your students? Uh, or are you a teacher that is interested in transforming the way that they think and the way that they live? Obviously, as Christian educators, our goal is to be transformational teachers and educators. But I would suggest to you that many of the things that we do in education uh, show and indicate that we are actually very transactional in what we're doing. What do I mean by transactional? Transactional uh, types of teaching include the basic idea that if a student does enough work, if they meet enough of the checklist of things that are expected by the teacher, they will get a good grade. A transformational teacher, on the other hand, insists on there being mental and emotional uh, cognitive change shown in order for a student to do well in their course. Uh, so we would all like to think that we are transformational teachers, but I think uh, after we look at today's presentation, we'll probably look at that a little bit differently and maybe perhaps say, boy, there's a lot of things that I need to change when it comes to my teaching and my planning with my curriculum as it relates to uh, learning and learning styles. I want us to take just a moment here at the beginning, and I have listed out eight things that we do in classes, eight things that we do in schools. And I want you to take a moment and rank these eight things by the least influential in learning to the most influential in learning. In other words, which of these things cause young people to learn more? Uh, is that professional development by teachers, summer vacation, reciprocal teaching, frequency of testing, uh, class size, formative evaluations, teacher training, writing programs. Which of these methods cause people to learn more than the others? Go and rank them real quick. What's the lowest one on your scale? Which one, in other words, would cause the least amount of learning to take place? And then which would be the one that would be the, uh, the highest uh, influencer of learning? Rank them real quick, real quick if you can. 1 through 8, 1 being the lowest uh, effect on learning, and number 8 being the highest effect on learning. We'll talk about these at the end of this uh, discussion here in a minute, and I want you to be kind of thinking about that as we go through. So rank them real quick, 1 to 8, and ask ourselves uh, this question, how can we actually know then which of these is most effective? And I would suggest to you that it depends on the standard uh, which we are using in education. We as teachers have a challenge ahead of us, and that is that in education there's often a mentality that anything goes. In other words, what you do in your classroom is up to you, and what the teacher down the hall does in their classroom is up to them, and no one has the right to question or tell them that they can't do it that way. There is a great deal of autonomy in teaching, and with autonomy comes the unfortunate uh, consequence that there are a lot of teachers just kind of doing whatever seems to come natural, uh, whatever was done to them perhaps, uh, do unto others as was done unto you. That's the eleventh commandment uh, of teaching. And so there is a lot of autonomy in education and teachers expect to be left alone to do what is right or what they think is right uh, for their students. What works for them? They expect to have the freedom in their classrooms to do what they think is best and that's fine and good but oftentimes we use terms like teaching style 
or professional independence to excuse the fact that we just don't want to change. Uh, we resent anyone telling us that we're doing it wrong. And we, we actually mean, I just want to do things my way. I want to do it the way that I want to do it. And teaching like, um, is unlike other industries in which teachers have a ton of freedom without anybody really checking up on them, uh, unfortunately, sometimes. And so there's a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of stiffening, if you will, or resentment when we're told that we need to do things a different way or a better way. And so the bottom line is really that none of us want to change anything. We're all pretty convinced that we're doing things uh, the right way. And so we have to be careful about this attitude because we assume a lot of things that are working without necessarily knowing for sure that they are. And sometimes um, in education, it's wise for us to kind of take a step back and ask ourselves, is what I'm doing in my class with my curricula really the best approach, really the best method? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I doing what I'm doing because there's evidence to say this is what helps students learn? Or am I doing what I'm doing because this was what my teachers did to me when I was in high school or middle school or elementary school or college? What are we reverting back to, falling back on? Teachers naturally assume and believe that we already know what works. Uh, there's no other industry, I think, in which on day one, uh, the, the uh, educators, the workers, if you will, in the field believe they know what they're doing. And uh, we naturally think that we just kind of know what works. And yet I would suggest that a lot of what we're basing this on is anecdotal evidence. In other words, well, this works for me. Or uh, it's the way that I was taught to do it. Uh, this is what the teacher program that I was in, this is what they taught me to do. And that's kind of what I'm doing. I've been doing it this way for years. Um, it was, it's what teachers did to me. So it probably works for my students as well. Um, or one of my favorites, um, it's just common sense. It just makes sense to do it this way. And um, the problem there is that if common sense is the litmus test, then anything goes. Because whatever it is will make sense to someone. And so that's really a dangerous way to approach education. We ought to be asking ourselves, am I really doing uh, what is best for uh, my students? And how do I know if it's really what's best? Is there something better? Is there a better way to be doing uh, what I'm doing? I think a, a wise steward uh, is someone who will be willing to ask that question. Uh, and so autonomy can be a dangerous thing in education uh, because I personally am not likely to correct me. And yet if you are like me uh, in your school, uh, the likelihood of you being observed on a day-to-day -day -day basis in your classroom teaching by your principal or your supervisor is probably pretty unlikely. Uh, we're oftentimes left alone. And so I want to say again, we often just kind of revert to what was done to us. And when we are um, in a pinch, we revert to what's easy. Think about the last time that you had to substitute in a, another classroom. Perhaps a teacher was sick or someone uh, couldn't make it to their class for some reason. So you, in a pinch, had to step in and cover their class. What did you revert to? Well, we reverted to something quick, something easy, something that was done to us. Uh, just kind of things that make uh, sense in, in, um, in classrooms and teaching. And yet, I would suggest that we do this way too often when we ought to be planning to do something better. And teachers have relatively little objective evaluation. It's unfortunate, but it's true that we don't necessarily get observed as much as we would like to. We don't usually have other teachers coming to our classrooms and giving us uh, feedback. Um, we are, you know, we're not reading up on scientific studies that have been conducted in our classroom or other classrooms. Uh, we aren't necessarily comparing test scores from this year to last year. Uh, and so a lot of what we do, we're relying on anecdotal evidence. Um, and sometimes that's often acceptable. Obviously, we'd be very foolish not to accept or to think about our past experiences. Experience can be a good teacher. Uh, it can be a very harsh teacher. But it's not the best teacher. Um, life is naturally built on old experiences. So there's nothing wrong with um, with, with uh, re remembering them and basing some things off of them. But herein lies the problem. And the problem is that if we believe as educators that every child is different, which most teachers would say, yes, every child is different, every child is unique, then why in the world would we insist on doing things the exact same way that we've always done them? 
if we truly believe that children are unique, then why do we can continue to revert back to what's easiest for us? And that's a very good question, I think, for us to think about. We need a balance, then, between experience and innovation, new things. If we settle for experience being the teacher, being the standard, then we're going to stiffen when innovation is suggested. When we're offered a chance to rethink what we're doing, we will often uh, resent that. And it's unfortunate, but it's true. And we need a good balance. Teachers sometimes often settle for experience, but they stiffen at innovation. We uh, often say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I would ask the question, how do you know it ain't broke? You know, what's the standard you're using to know uh, if it's working or not? Is it anecdotal? Well, this has always worked for me. This was what was done to me. Um, this is what I did last year. Um, we just keep going full circle back to the standard of, of me being the criteria by which I'm judging my own effectiveness. Wouldn't we be better off to find some more objective reasoning, some more objective arguments, some more objective proof that what we're doing is actually working? In other words, is there a standard that's better than just me? Can we really know what's helping children learn, young people learn? What is more effective? What is most effective? What are the things uh, that are working in education? And probably most importantly, am I willing to adjust and change if there is something better? And so I want to suggest to, you, to us today that the standard by which we can make good decisions in education is educational research. And this is the body of knowledge and literature that tells us what's going on in the broader field of education. Uh, the literature involved in education, there is so much literature and articles and publications talking about what's going on in education, but uh, it's often neglected. This is unfortunate. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be intimidating in educational research. When you just hear that terminology, you may cringe at the thought of research. It may sound intimidating, and that's that's fine and good, but there's a lot of things that are rather, rather simple to understand. I, I want to read you a, a quick uh, paragraph from a research text. This is a text by Gall, uh, published. Uh, it's a research uh, text for uh, grad school for conducting research, but he, has, he makes an interesting analogy here, uh, asking us the question, what does educational research do for us? He, he breaks it down like this. He says, if doctors were to lose their base of medical research, uh, most of them would have to stop working. They would have no idea how to treat anything except common ailments. Surgeons, for example, could not perform open heart surgery if they lacked research-based knowledge about heart functions, anesthesia, the meaning of symptoms, and the likely risks of particular surgical procedures. In contrast, if educators suddenly were to lose the body of knowledge that has been gained thus far from educational research, their work would be virtually unaffected. Schools would continue to operate pretty much as they do now. It's difficult to imagine teachers who would refuse to teach students because they did not possess sufficient research-based knowledge about the learning process or the effectiveness of different instructional methods. The point of this comparison of medicine and education is that research still has relatively little influence on the day-to-day -day work of educators. This assessment of educational practice raises an important question. Why should one do educational research? And that's an interesting comparison. Why should we be concerned with educational research? I want to kind of break that down for us here today just very quickly and help us understand as educators, as professional educators, as graduate students, what is the importance of educational research? Research does uh, several things for us. Here's four things real quick that Gall says educational research does for us. First of all, it tells us what's happening in schools. It describes the situation in education. We develop instruments, surveys, and polls, and tests that can be given to students to understand what they have learned and what they know. But before these tests can be used, they have to be validated. There has to be research behind them to legitimize them. For example, if you give any kind of standardized testing in your school, those tests have to be researched heavily. They have to be validated and authenticated, used uh, thousands and thousands of times before they hold any weight. So educational research describes for us what's uh, going on in schools. It, pr it can predict what's going to happen in students' lives. How well can this predict that? And the value uh, of this is common sense. We, we commonsensically want to know what will be the effect of teaching this subject or teaching this way 
on this student in the future. So we won't be able to predict. We can't do that without research. Uh, educational research uh, tells us how to improve our schools. Uh, how, does an how well does an intervention work? How well does a specific um, idea, when it's implemented, how well does it work? And research also explains a lot of things for us. It tells us how to identify a problem. It can show us how to predict the consequences and then kind of figure out what to do about it, how to intervene. And so research does quite a few things for us if we'll give it time and really think about what it's doing. In research, educational research, just kind of want to break this down for us so we kind of understand what we're talking about here. Uh, the, the basic level of educational research is dissertations. These are the research studies conducted by doctoral students. And I would hope that many of the graduate students that are taking this course would consider going on further and uh, pursuing a doctoral degree. But in a uh, dissertation, a uh, study is put together. There's lots of reading. There's lots of research, a lot of writing going on. And that's just kind of the very foundational level of, e of educational research. A, a dissertation that's well written, that can be published, goes to a peer-reviewed journal. And a peer-reviewed journal uh, will take that dissertation, they'll pull it apart, they'll assess it, see if it's worthy of being printed. And if it can get into a journal, well, now we have thousands and thousands of ideas printed in journals that we can learn something from. And so these are somewhat limit, limited in the fact that um, they're, you know, these studies are done in different populations all over the world, different environments, different contexts. But there is a lot of many, many ideas, a litany of ideas in which we can understand what's going on in education. Well, in um, the, the old method for understanding all this information was to do a literature review. But there's been a newer method since about the 1970s and 80s called a meta-analysis. And we're going to talk about that specifically here in just a couple of minutes. A meta-analysis is taking thousands and thousands of journal articles and synthesizing them all together to understand in a bigger sense what is all this research showing us. And so one way that researchers take all these journal articles and put them together is they'll evaluate a study and they will assess based on the statistics of the study, they'll give it an effect size. And the effect size is an indicator of, of what that study revealed uh, statistically. And we're going to come back to effect size here in just a minute. Once we have a meta-analysis, uh, we understand that this is a ton of work that someone has already done for us. And all we need to do is pick it up and read about it. And the effect size then in a meta-analysis takes, again, lots of studies and compares them to each other and tells us, well, this works better than this, and this doesn't work as well as this. So a meta-analysis is really a great tool for understanding what's going on in research. It's really kind of as, um, as we think of educational research, one of the best tools available to us. Well, the very top end of that would be something called a mega-analysis, in which we're taking uh, many, many meta-analyses and putting them together. This is this is really the gold standard. I mean, this is as good as it gets in educational research. If you can get yourself get your hands on a mega-analysis, uh, it's very usually interesting to read. A lot of good conclusions drawn from it. But why do we cringe at educational research? Well, understandably, research can be something that can be dull and tedious. Uh, we might look at it and say, "Man, this is just overwhelming amount of information." Uh, if you go to Google Scholar and you search for uh, just even just the word education, you'll get millions and millions of hits. There's so much information out there, it can be very hard to filter. So a meta-analysis, or a mega-analysis even, is someone having already done this work for you. There can be a lot of good information out there for us. It's at our fingertips. And so it would be really nice if someone took all that information and broke it down for us into one place. And the good news is that many authors have. So I want to talk about that for just a moment. In our text, our author talks about a couple of uh, studies, one by Cotton and one by Marzano, in which they have taken hundreds of journal articles and have synthesized them and broken them down. And uh, this is research-based evidence. There's, that's kind of a buzzword in education, research-based. If we can tell people that something is research-based, they'll believe just about anything. But research-based information is uh, information that has been tested and tried in schools, and so it's worth us uh, looking at and drawing some valid conclusions from it. And so in our text, two uh, meta-analyses have uh, been discussed here, but I want to introduce you to another one that is uh, really uh, a great resource for us in education, and it's, um, it's the author calls it Teaching's Holy Grail. And that's a, a work by John Hattie 
called Visible Learning, in which he takes over 800 meta-analyses and synthesizes them and breaks them down. And so what he's done here is he's taken uh, 138 educational topics, uh, topics like homework and uh, formal evaluation, some of those, uh, those eight things we talked about at the beginning of this uh, video. Uh, factors such as that in education, he's gone over, uh, these studies involve over 236 million students worldwide. And he's broken it down into a single continuum over what really works well and what doesn't work as well in education. And he's done this using a, a statistic called effect size, in which he takes an individual study, gives it, assigns it a statistic, it's a mathematical process, it's actually very lengthy, but he's able to take that and quantify the finding of that to be able to co compare it to other studies. It's actually a very interesting uh, concept. If you'd like to get this book and read up on it, I would highly encourage you to. This is a good investment, uh, this uh, visible learning. And there's a website I'm going to refer you to towards the end that's definitely worth your time taking a look at. But what he does is he takes all these studies and puts them on one continuum and uh, gives them an effect size. So let's talk about that here from an effect size then it is a single scale, single uh, statistic for comparing data across studies. Instead of giving us a statistic that says, yes, this works, it tells us how well this works when compared to other things. What's the magnitude of the effect that this is having? So an effect size is, is an incredible tool in which uh, we can compare studies with each other. And so an effect size is based on a standard deviation, which is a mathematical concept I'm assuming that you're aware of. But a standard deviation of one in an effect size would put a student way above other students. Uh, this would be this would mean that uh, if a student has a, an effect score, or if there's a finding that's an effect score of one, that 84% of the students not receiving the treatment didn't do as well. And so an effect size of one would be really, really huge. Uh, for example, uh, an effect size of one would be the difference between uh, maybe a high school senior and a K-5 student. And I'm speaking of achievement here, but it would be a very vast difference. So an effect size of one would be, would be very, very remarkable. But rather than just showing a statistical difference, uh, it allows us to make a, uh, an, a, an assessment, a judgment about the magnitude of difference. In other words, how does this um, issue of, say, homework or testing or teacher preparation, that factor, how does that in the research compare to all these other factors? Is it more influential? Is it less influential? We're able to put them all in one continuum. And so an effect size of one would be really remarkable. We wouldn't expect to have a huge effect size on most of these things. Uh, it would be putting a student maybe two or three or four years ahead of their peers, which would be very, very unusual. So we want to keep that in mind as we think about some of these factors. We're going to get some specifics here. Let's take in the example of homework. So one of the uh, meta-analyses that Hattie looked at was one on homework. And so he takes five studies, and there's some authors there uh, for you on the, on the slide, and over 161 studies were evaluated, uh, 100,000 or more students, and the average effect size of homework on achievement is 0.29. And so we look at that and say, well, that, that's, that's pretty good, 0.29, that sounds like it's very good. However, 0.29 is roughly a third of a standard deviation. And so we would expect a student having had homework to be about 0.3 ahead at the end of the year. So a 0.29 effect is really unremarkable. It's like the difference between a guy who's 5'11 and a guy who's 6 foot 0. Uh, there's a difference, but it's not much. It's uh, over, a, so, so over 161 studies, the best we can show is that students, because of homework, were one year ahead at the end of a school year. Well, what else would we expect? Obviously, we would expect them to be a year ahead. And so we can come to this conclusion, homework works, but not very much. What it, how does it work when compared to other things? That's the real question. Is homework good? Yes. Is homework better than other things? Well, we don't know yet. But this meta-analysis, this study, allows us to make that determination. So homework, then, we could say would be a transactional method. It's a method that people have used for years and years and years, and we continue to use it because we always have. It's making a difference, but it's not making that much of a difference. It's making a difference that we would expect it to make. But we sure spend a lot of time fighting about homework, don't we? 
when in the educational research we find that homework has a difference but there's probably other things that are making more of a difference than homework and so we want to take some time to think about that so we want to ask well what effect size really then is truly remarkable well if we have an effect size of 0.29 for homework and we say that's not really remarkable should we get rid of homework no 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 that's not necessarily the point the point is maybe we should be spending our time and our focus on other things that have a greater effect and so every small effect size shouldn't necessarily be ignored uh, let's say for example that I give my students mechanical pencils and then I have some other students who use just plain wood pencils and it turns out the effect of mechanical uh, pencils is 0.2 it's not very much but you know what mechanical pencils are so cheap why not do it so that's a small effect but it's worth doing because it's very simple to do let's say though that uh, we have an effect size of 0.75 for science achievement when students are taken down to NASA and introduced to an astronaut. 0.75. That's an incredible amount of achievement. But look how expensive that would be to take all of our students down to NASA so they can meet a scientist so we can increase their science achievement. So that's a large effect, but it's not practical to try it. So we have to ignore it. So what's a good standard? Well, a good standard that is worth shooting for then would be the average of all the effects. And so in John Hattie's study, he takes over 138 of these factors, puts them all into one scale, and finds that the average of all of them is 0 .40, 0 0.40. So as we look at these studies and this analysis, the hinge point is really 0 .40. That's the average. Our question is, what is above average? What things are 0.4 and above that are producing achievement that is above that average? These would be what Hattie would call transformational methods. These are the things that are really game changers in education. And the good news is that half of these innovations are over 0 .40. They're above average. Now, if we think back to homework a minute ago, homework of 0.29 is a below average indicator. Is it effective? Yes, it's having an effect, especially to a transactional teacher who insists on doing things that are tried and true with the way we've always done things. This is great evidence for a transactional teacher to continue giving loads and loads and loads of homework because it works. Well, it gets a student one year ahead, which is about what we want at the end of the year. And it's effective if you're under the false impression that zero is our standard. But we're not after just an effect, just an increase. We are after understanding and getting to those methods that are above average, the things that are really making a change in the understanding and the learning of students. So I'm not satisfied with 0.29. Are there things that are more effective than homework? Absolutely. In fact, half, over half of the studies and the uh, indicators that Hattie has gone over are showing they are more effective than just giving homework. Let's look at a couple of those here. And as we think about this, uh, maybe we should consider spending more time on those things that are actually showing a large effect in learning for students. And so this again is the challenge. If we are presented with evidence that shows that there are methods in education that will help students learn more, are we willing to say to ourselves, maybe some of the things that I've been doing aren't as effective as I think they are. Maybe some of the things I'm doing in education, I'm doing just because it was done unto me. Maybe I need to rethink some of the things and the methods that I'm doing using in my classroom and in education. It's worth definitely thinking about. So here for the next couple of minutes, I have a graphic for us called the barometer of effects. And this is John Hattie's way of showing what things are transactional effects, things that are below average, and things that are above average, the things we really ought to be shooting for. And the things below average he calls developmental effects or teacher effects. In other words, just, um, just having a teacher in the room, just having the students sit down on the desks, we're probably going to have some of these transactional effects taking place. If a student just shows up with a pulse uh, and is warm-blooded, they're going to learn something. But again, we are looking for things that are above average. So let's take a look again at these eight areas in which we started this lecture on and really understand from this educational research, from the Hattie research, what things are above average, which things are having an influence more than others. So here we go. The first uh, method 
uh, not surprisingly, is summer vacation. This actually has a detrimental effect on learning, and it gets worse as grade level increases. Uh, so teachers will be wise to figure out specifically what areas are being hurt and focus on these rather than all areas. Summer vacation actually has a reverse effect on learning. And we as teachers know this just makes a lot of sense. I mean, students come back in August or September after having three months off of school, and what do you know, they have forgotten some things. They've regressed. So it makes pretty good sense that summer vacation is actually detrimental uh, to student learning. The next one that uh, had a, or at least in our eight that we've looked at, at, and there's 138 of these, is teacher training. Now, teacher training, this does not mean that since there's an effect of just 0.11, it's not important. Certainly, uh, we need to be uh, trained as teachers. But this reiterates the fact that we as educators have a lot to learn. And, and the best teachers are those who are willing to teach themselves more things and doing more. And uh, teaching is way more than just knowing content knowledge. Uh, content knowledge, by the way, is one of Hattie's effects. It's a 0.09. 0.09, that's, that's way down there. Just knowing your subject matter does not make you a great teacher, a great educator. Uh, the next one in our barometer of effects is uh, reduced class size. Uh, having a smaller class size makes a difference in education, but it's not really that much. A 0.21, when compared to other things, is not that big. Reducing classes doesn't necessarily help, but, you, but on the other hand, uh, increasing class sizes doesn't necessarily uh, help either. And so this is something to consider. So number three is reduced class size. Frequency of testing, uh, number four, 0.34. Um, this would show us, again, that giving a lot of tests is not necessarily a, uh, a good thing. And yet what do we do a lot in education? We give a lot of tests. We test, test, test. We assume we have to squeeze in a test before the weekend. We assume we have to get in another test before the vacation, uh, you know, Christmas vacation starts. Everybody's scrambling to get in another test. Giving tests has an effect, but it's not a very high effect when it comes to achievement. Uh, as you read some of Hattie's work, you'll see that he explains some of these things. And one of the conclusions he comes to on this one is that a large number of short tests uh, is better than a short number of long tests. In other words, the shorter, the better. Uh, and the more closely together these are, the better. We'll talk about that here in just a minute with, with some of the other factors. But test length can create lower grades. And yet, what is our tendency in education? To make really long tests, to make them really hard, make them really challenging. And yet, this does not have as much of an effect on learning as we would like to think that it would. The next one here, number five, writing programs. Number Now now we're above 0 .40, so now we're talking about effects that are above average. What are the things that are causing a bigger effect than some of the other things? Writing programs is one of them. This is not just you know writing for the sake of writing. This is a communication strategy. These are teaching students how to write well, how to uh, cre uh, create good logic, good reasoning, good organization, good syntax, uh, good uh, grammar usage. And so writing is a good way to help increase achievement. In fact, it's better than uh, frequency of testing, as you think of it on this scale. And also thinking critically about what other people have written and studying writing as a, as a subject. Uh, number six, professional development. Uh, the more that a teacher is learning themselves, uh, the more this increases their job satisfaction, their own confidence, uh, their willingness to learn, their knowledge about their subject matter. So educators owe it to their students and their students' achievement to be growing professionally as educators. And your learning as a teacher affects the learning of your students. In fact, it affects it more than some other things that we're doing in education. Number seven, reciprocal teaching. Having uh, students be the teachers and teaching the concepts to other students, to their peers. Uh, we all learn more when we have, have to teach something to someone else. And uh, so this is a good idea to let the students be the teacher a little bit, to guide their, to guide their instruction, of course, but to allow them to teach others uh, the things that they are learning. And so um, it teaches students then to kind of monitor their own understanding. And so reciprocal teaching actually has a very high effect, 0.74. Uh, students who are involved in reciprocal teaching show a very high level of achievement. 
The final one here, number eight, formative evaluations, 0 0.90. This is putting students way ahead. And it's not the abundance of quizzing for quizzing's sake, but because it's not for the student's sake, it's for the teacher's sake to be able to evaluate how well they are teaching. Think about this. When students take a quiz or a test and the students don't do well on it, a transactional teacher blames the students. When students don't do well, a transactional teacher blames the students. If students take a quiz or a test and do poorly on it, a transformational teacher blames themselves. And they ask themselves, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? What do I need to do to help my students achieve more? So formative evaluations, uh, those that are given along the way before the summative evaluation, those give a wise teacher a chance to evaluate themselves in order to be offering students a better education which increases their achievement. And so quizzing for quizzing sake, testing for testing sake, is, is unwise. What is the teacher learning from it? How are they adjusting their teaching to increase achievement uh, based on what they are doing? And uh, this gives us the ability to have feedback from our students and to, to change the way that we're doing things so they can achieve more. It doesn't mean watering things down. It doesn't mean spoon feeding answers. It does mean though adjusting and being willing to change the way that I'm teaching to help students learn more. What is the ultimate goal of what we're doing? Is it convenience for teachers? Is it simplicity of work for teachers? Well, no, obviously it's student achievement. But what do we oftentimes base what we're doing on, uh, what we're doing, what are we basing that on? We're oftentimes basing it on what's easiest for me. And that is not helping students learn. And so it's very wise of a transformational teacher to consider these things. I want to refer you to John Hattie's website, visiblelearning.org. There's a hyphen in between, visible-learning.org. And on his website, you will see his scale of all 138 factors of education and their effect sizes. And I would encourage you to take a look at this website, uh, purchase the book, uh, look at some of John Hattie's work. It really is interesting research and very, very applicable to what we're doing uh, in education. And I would encourage you, as we uh, think about education, we want to be transformational teachers. And you know, we spend a lot of time and effort arguing about the things that really are showing very little effect. I mean, how, how often have we heard arguments for and against homework? But homework is not a game changer in education. There are so many more things that will help students learn than homework. Why are we so defensive about what we have always done? Uh, why do we get um, on edge when people criticize or when we go to a conference session that criticizes things that we have already done? Well, we should be asking ourselves, instead of what works, we should be asking ourselves what works best. Is Are there a lot of factors in, in school that are working? Yes. In fact, all of them are probably working to some extent. The question ought to be, what is working best? I want to leave us today with a remark that is in Hattie's book, but it's by an author named Karl Popper. And he wrote this, Bold ideas, unjustified anticipations, and speculative thought are our only means for interpreting nature, our only organon, our only instrument for grasping her. And we must hazard them to win our prize. Those among us who are unwilling to expose their ideas to the hazard of refutation, do not take part in the scientific game. What Popper is saying there is simply this. If we are unwilling to criticize ourselves, to look at what we're doing and ask ourselves the question, is this really what's best for student? We are the real losers. And so as we develop curriculum, are we just simply settling for what was done to us? Or are we truly asking ourselves, do I want to be a transformational leader, a transformational teacher in education? Am I just conducting business? Am I just giving students a set of uh, tasks to accomplish and I just hand them a grade? Or am I transforming lives? Am I changing lives? Am I uh, affecting achievement? Uh, I'm not willing to just give students what they expected. I want to be a different kind of teacher. I don't want to be the kind of just the kind of teacher that I had. I had great teachers in middle school and in high school and college. I had great, fantastic teachers. But I want to be my own kind of teacher. I want to set my I want to set my sights high. 
and I want to be the best that I can be to help my students learn all that they possibly can. I'm not satisfied just to, to dwell on anecdotal evidence. Well, this seems to work, or this is what I did last year. This is what people have always done. I want to be incorporating anecdotal evidence, experience, which is a good thing, with some empirical evidence in educational research that's really showing uh, what is going on in our field of education. Why do we avoid educational research? It involves hard work. And we are naturally given uh, to laziness, to not changing things, to not seeking what's better and what is best. We revert to what is easy. But what is easy for us is not always necessarily what's best for our students. And we owe it to young people. We owe it to uh, children. We owe it to their parents to really ask ourselves, uh, how am I considering learning and learning styles? Am I, as a professional educator, uh, considering that there are some methods that work better than others, and I'm incorporating those into what I'm doing each day? It's definitely worth our time to study them out and to make plans to apply them for the benefit of our students and our schools so that they truly can be educated, that they can achieve, a, that they can achieve as much as humanly possible, and so that I will be a transformational teacher.